right. Welcome back to the Alcohol Tipping Point podcast. I'm your host, Debbie Maisner, registered nurse, health coach, and alcohol-free badass. And I'm excited to have another alcohol-free badass on the podcast today. Her name is Blair Sharp. And she is um, a self-proclaimed, I guess, sobriety activist <laughs> <laughs> and a writer. So thank you, Blair, for joining the podcast. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Great. So tell us a little bit about um, who you are, where you're calling from, and what you do. Yeah. So um, I'm Blair. I am from Minnesota. And I am a wife, a mom of a five-year-old little boy. Um, uh, in my, my, my daytime gig is uh, I work as a psychometrist. No one ever knows oh, what that means, but yeah. I give people think, thinking tests. So like memory and attention, problem solving, those kind of tests. Um, so I've been doing that for almost eight years now. And then um, I recently just almost up on my one year here of um, posting content, like supportive, inspirational, funny content about uh, living an alcohol free life on Instagram. So I've been doing that for just about a year. I've been alcohol free myself for almost four years in February to be four years. Um, and I also do writing. I write for a uh, parenting resource in my city here in Rochester, Minnesota. And then i um, also contribute to the Sober Curator website um, and then do my own sort of writing for uh, whoever would like me to write for them. <laughs> well, that's great. So from Minnesota, I just Minnesota. can't help it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I usually do that too. I say, yeah, I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you betcha, you know. Are you born and raised there? I am. Yep. I live about 45 minutes from where I grew up, but I've lived here in Rochester for, I want to say 17 years, which is crazy to think now. I'm almost more here than I was in my hometown, but still very close to my hometown. My mother still lives there too. So. Oh yeah. Great. Well, what was your experience with alcohol like? Yeah. So, um, for me, it was always kind of a social thing. Um, but I, I always drank hard. I drank more than everybody else. I was a binge drinker pretty much from the start, uh, without an off switch. Um, I started drinking in my late teens in high school, um, where, you know, it was just the thing you did right to, to, uh, experiment and the people that I was around were, were doing it. So I started doing it too. I liked it from the beginning. Um, I had moments where it was too much and um, it was over the top from the beginning as well. There were moments now when I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, there's a, there's a time that stands out in my, my mind that it was a problem, you know, um, back then you just, you just think, you know, this is what, this is how it is. This is what kids do and they drink too much and they get sick or they do things, they regret things like that. So um, I never thought about it as being a problem back back then. Um, and then when I went to college was when I really, I say my drinking really flourished. I really <laughs> became a professional drinker. <laughs> I majored in alcohol, right? Yeah. Um, I went to school for, because, you know, it was what you did. I I partied. Drinking was the number one priority. It wasn't school. Um People say, you know, I'll talk to people now and they talk about their, oh, my um, undergrad and I had this class and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, boy, that would have been nice to even care about any of that back then. But it was always about the party and what are we doing now? What are we doing tomorrow night, you know, and drinking for days on end and um, just making bad decisions. Um, lots of things that, you know, maybe somebody would say, okay, this is a red flag. Um, that shouldn't happen, but it was happening to other people that I knew things that were happening, you know, con a pretty regular blacking out, um, throughout college and up until I quit. Um, and then, uh, let's see when I was 25, I had just met my husband a year prior and I got a DWI, um, I had to spend two nights in jail and I blew so high. So I had to spend two nights in jail cause I had to go to court before I got out of jail. Um, so that was a interesting experience that I definitely didn't fit in there. Um, I felt very um, out of place while in jail. 
as one would, I suppose. Um, and even then it wasn't like a red flag. Like there was no like thinking, Oh, I'm going to stop drinking. Maybe I should chill out. Maybe I should even sit and reflect about this. It was just like, okay, what do I have to do now to get through, you know, what classes do I have to take or what, uh, court appearances do I need to make to, um, to get past this. And so that's kind of what it always was when I would have big, like, uh, quote unquote rock bottom moments. You know, that might be a rock bottom for someone, but they never were for me, but it would be like this moment that something bad happened. And then, um, I kind of have to deal with it. Right. And then like, um, time would go on and there would be a moment of like trying to, you kind of just like forget, pretend like it didn't happen or like forget that it happened, just ignore it pretty much. Um, so that's kind of how I like got through all those quote unquote rock bottom moments. Um, and I've been with my husband since, and he is a non-drinker actually. Um, he doesn't drink. He never has, he drank when he was like much younger, but in college he quit drinking just because he had gotten really sick and never had a problem with alcohol or anything like that though. Um, but so he stuck by me this whole time. He, uh, must've seen something in me, um, you know, to stick around, but, um, there were not really any moments where, where I, um, said, you know, this is, this is a problem, even though there were lots of problems that happened throughout my drinking. So, um, eventually, um, I became a mother when I was 30 and, um, you know, your body changes after you, you have a baby. And I kind of thought, okay, I can, I can just do this and just have a couple, like I can have a couple and then be done. And, and that didn't last for very long. Um, cause I just didn't ever have that off switch. And even then, then I did night. And of course I felt then like my body, um, reacted to it a little bit differently after I had my son, you know, it was, it took me less to get a buzz, but I was still drinking just as much. So I would be blacking out, you know, every time. Um, and it was a lot more drinking like at home, um, often, you know, like by myself because I had the baby there, so I couldn't go anywhere or if like my husband was out, um, you know, hanging out with friends or something, then I would be home and I would just, you know, have a, have a couple, but really it would be like a couple bottles, you know, by the end of the night of wine or whatever it was. Uh, it was always too much, whatever it was. It was always more than was necessary. Um, and that was kind of throughout, throughout my drinking was kind of the, the theme. But, um, and there was one night that I, my husband was away and I was home with my son. He was sleeping. I had drank some wine. I was walking around and tripped over the baby gate that we had up and I shattered the wine glass on the floor. And, um, so my husband came home and I was picking up the wine glass and I had little cuts, you know, on my hands and cleaning it up. And this is not something that was weird. Like this could happen any other day, mm -hmm. you know, like this wasn't a weird thing. I would fall all the time. So this was like a, um, you know, I've been to the ER before, like for falls. And stuff. so this wasn't like a, a, a big, you know, so <clears throat> went to bed, woke up the next morning, bruised, sore, you know, which was typical anyways of me. Um, and I just felt like horrible. And, and so lit, to back up, like after I had my son, I would have these like really bad hangovers, you know, cause I would drink way too much. Then I'd have like two days of physical hangover being sick to the point where sometimes I couldn't even, you know, drink water. But, um, and then a couple days after that physical hangover, I would have this like emotional hangover where like, I feel like, you know, why did I do that? Why can't I drink like everybody else? Why you know, I hate myself and all this kind of stuff. And so that, that night then when that happened, that was another one of those where it was Friday night. I was, you know, celebrating the weekend. Right. Um, and had too much, had a physical hangover on, on Saturday or Sunday and, Monday, uh, I was lo self-loathing myself at work and, and read a blog post from uh, Scary Mommy. I don't know if you know Scary Mommy is online mm -hmm. yeah. publication, right? Um, read a blog post, <clears throat> excuse me, about a mom who doesn't drink. And she told some story about being out in public with her daughter and they had been talked to by some women, made some jokes about drinking, and, and so she had... Uh, written this whole blog about it and I looked her up and I listened to her be on a podcast and I listened to her or I read some other blogs that she had written 
And I typed her name into Facebook and I sent her a message and I said, uh, it was like a really long message. It's like 900 words or something, which is like a whole blog post in itself. Um, I still have it. I, um, you know, said, I can't do this anymore. I need to stop. Um, I don't know what to do. I know I can't drink anymore. I don't know how to not drink. Like that's who I am. All this whole thing. And to my surprise, she wrote back pretty quickly while I was just sitting there at my desk. And so we had this exchange where she told me, you know, you don't have to drink anymore if you don't want to. Like, it's possible to be normal and just not drink. Like, there's tons of people out there who just decide they don't want to drink anymore without having to go to jail, which I had already done, but go to jail Mm -hmm. and be forced, you know, be forced into it or, um, you know, go to rehab or these things that we think that we have to have happened before we actually have to make that change. And so I didn't even know that. I mean, I didn't know that you don't know until you know, you know, most things. But, um, so I haven't drank from, from then on. And that's the day that I, I celebrate. I, the day that I decided because the days before where I was just hung over, I had like literally in my mind, there was no like, okay, this is it. I'm not doing this again. It was that Monday after where I was kind of like emotionally hung over and, So February 26, 2018 is the day that I celebrate. That's great. So it it does sound like you um, had somewhat of a like spontaneous sobriety. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard that phrase before and I need to investigate it a little bit more. But I like that because that's kind of what it was. It was just a typical drinking time that I had and decided it's it, you know. And did you do anything to help you stop or did you just kind of wash your hands of it and you were done? Like what, what was helpful for you? Yeah. Um, I got some advice from that, that woman. I, she had given me, um, some ideas of books and, you know, the quit lit. Um, Mm -hmm. she told me to read this naked mind by Annie Grace. And that's the number one thing I think that really helped me, um, just realized that I didn't need it as much as I thought I did. I didn't need alcohol, you know, like I thought I did. Like we're told we do like throughout our lives for every little situation. Um, And then I also was told to listen to home podcasts, which Mm -hmm. is a podcast with, you know, Laura McCowan and um, Holly Whitaker that they did long ago. Um, But that podcast was great. And I, I really um, felt like Laura's, story and her uh, relationship with alcohol was very similar to mine. So I really like latched onto her. And so she's like one of my biggest um, inspirations, I guess Mm -hmm. you could say. Um, So I think when you find that, that person or somebody else's story that really resonates with your story, you're like, Oh, well they did this, you know, or makes you feel like less alone. Yeah. I think that having connection, having other people to relate to yes. really helps um, because you do feel alone. Like you said, <clears throat> excuse me, you're, I mean, you, you thought, oh, I have to really hit rock bottom, whatever that right. is, the proverbial yeah. rock bottom um, mm-hmm. before I can get help. Cause it, I mean, it, before you do your research, it, it does seem like okay, well, I could do AA or I could do inpatient rehab. And it's like, well, I really don't want to do either one of those. Exactly, yeah. And now there's so much out there. What what made you start Sobriety Activist? And and a lot later in your sobriety, too. I I did make a um, a private alcohol-free Instagram account when I first quit. Mm. I think it was probably within that first year. Someone, I don't know if I, I was in some, also some Facebook groups. Those are really good. A lot of the uh, Facebook groups, or there's a lot of sober Facebook groups out there that people can just like vent or ask for advice. So I was in some of those and I don't know if that's where somebody told me or what, but so yeah, I made like a private, uh, separate from sobriety activists. It wasn't this one, but um just to post, you know, like your days and what you're dealing with and, and everything. Um, and then, you know, like I hit alcohol hard, I hit this sober life really hard too. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I didn't really know who I was without alcohol. So now here I am this person who doesn't drink and I really just like totally immersed myself into it. I was in these, um, 
groups, these Marco Polo like text groups with some of the people like in the Silver Sis program. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, that group. And then we are the luckiest. I don't know if they had their group back then, but there's just a bunch of groups on Facebook and online. And so I was doing those and constantly listening to podcasts, memoirs, quit lit, all that stuff. And so eventually after maybe a year or so, I was like, okay, I got to figure out who I am without alcohol. Cause I'm not just a person who doesn't drink. Like that's just part of who I am. I just happen to not drink now, you know? And so like, what do I like to do? And so then I spent a few years just kind of doing whatever I had, you know, a little, a little child. So he kept me pretty busy and still does. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, I would post things here and there on my personal Instagram account and Facebook, but you know, people who don't really have an issue with drinking don't really want to hear about that all the time. So, um, I didn't, I didn't post too much, but, um, and then last year there was, um, the time when Tropicana, the orange juice company, Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I remember this this campaign. Yep. About a year ago almost now. Um, they had this campaign called take them the moment where they sent celebrities, these mini fridges to put their, champagne and orange juice in so they could take a moment Mm -hmm. away from their kids to have a mimosa right and so there was this big campaign and um sober instagram as they do really went after the tropicana brand and uh the celebrities that were involved in it and they eventually took it down i think it was only a day or two after um the campaign went up and so i was I was posting about that too. I was screenshotting and posting my comments and everything. And I was doing that on my personal page, my personal Instagram, my personal Facebook, where all my, you know, in real life friends and family are. Um, and the New York post had page six, had a, um, an article about it. And they said, sobriety activists were gobsmacked when they found, you know, traffic blah, 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 blah. And I was like, read it to my husband and I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm a sobriety activist. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you helped like that with that. Like you were a part of that. You were one of those people, you know, that went out and posted and commented and shared and got people to be aware of it and everything. I was like, Oh my gosh, that's what I am. And it totally fit into like how I felt, you know, in the moment. So I quick jumped on Instagram and got the handle sobriety activist, had no idea what I was going to do with it. I was just going to use it in the beginning to be sort of a thing for myself so that I could like, um, post about whatever, like literally whatever I wanted to about not drinking. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't really, I don't, you know, have these groups that I'm in or anything like that really. Um, I didn't really feel like at this time, you know, I was almost three years sober at that point. And so, um, I didn't, I don't feel like I, I need those things right now, you know, not like on the verge of drinking or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of like a fun thing. And I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I know there's tons of, you know, these sober influencers, I guess you could say for lack of a better term, um, out there that are doing these posts and things like that. So I started doing that. I got involved with 1000 hours dry, um, and just started posting, sharing, commenting, and it has now grown. I have over uh, 7,000 followers now, um, in less than a year already. So, yeah, now it's just kind of fun to be to be that supportive person that I needed, you know, that I I had when I was first starting out. I'm now that person for for other people, so it's kind of cool. And what do you think are some of the issues related to sobriety activism? I mean, you mentioned the Tropicana campaign. You know, just for people listening that are like, "What's wrong yeah. with the Tropicana campaign?" Like, what's wrong with that? Yeah, because they're you know promoting it to parents directly. Like, I don't, I don't get too bent out of shape when it's just let's promote drinking to whatever. But when it's like promoting it to parents as a way to escape from their kids, like that is not, it's not okay. So I mean, in the, the Tropicana campaign, to be specific, had Molly Sims. I don't know if she's an actress model. I think she's in her closet hiding from her kids. Like her post, I mean, she said she's hiding from her kids in this post, I believe. And she's like, this, this mimosa makes me the best mom. (laughs) Right. And so just like that promotion to parents is like, what's so infuriating is, um, is when they're promoting it to parents or as a way to cope. 
Um, or like we see these other places like, uh, like build a bear this last year had a, from, I think it was a mother's day. They had a bear, a couple of different bear outfits you could buy. And it was like, Oh, mom's going to love this. And it was like a bear with a champagne glass and like a oh. martini glass. Yeah. So actually we got them to take that down too. They, I say we like we're this organization, <laughs> so You're they, not- the sober Instagram activists, um, <laughs> They did. They took that down eventually, too, because everyone was posting about it and sharing. Um, And I think the big thing is like this. Yeah, the message to parents is the big thing. Um, And I think anytime we're dealing with like also like mental health, um, mental health, they're saying, you know, this will relax you or this or whatever. It's like, actually, you should read the science about that because it's not going to help. So, um but yeah, and so people will be sending me these things that they see at different stores or, um, you know, other posts. I think, who was it the other day? The Today Show had a, a post of Amy Schumer holding her son. And then she was like, re- she had a drink or holding, she was holding him. And he's sleeping and they're in a restaurant and she's like behind his head, like drinking a, a alcoholic beverage. And I don't know what the Today Show said, like, oh, we're. I don't know, like moms are feeling seen and it's like, no, we're not like, that is not okay. You know? So just any of those little things, like I'll usually share on my story and comment, always comment on it. Yeah. I th- I think, you know, it's been talked about a lot, but I, I don't think we've really talked about it on my podcast, but the whole mm-hmm. mommy wine drinking culture yeah. and normalizing drinking during the day and drinking right. as a way of coping with parenthood. Can you speak to that mommy wine culture a little bit? Yeah. Um, and I think it's one of those things like you don't see it as a problem until you're like stepped away. Like you yeah. Stepped away from it. You know what I mean? Cause like in the moment, yeah, I'd love to have a drink during the day, you know, back, back when I was drinking, like on a Saturday, oh yeah, it's Saturday, like I can have a drink, but like for me, it wasn't ever a drink, right? I'd get drunk <laughs> and then not being, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to drive my kid to the hospital if he had to go or whatever, you know, uh, people, think, people forget about that. Like, what if something happens? You got to drive your child I, somewhere, you know, yeah. you, nobody's there to drive. Like who's driving? I'm always like at a party. I'm like, who's, who's taking the kids to the hospital if something happens right now? Cause none of you all are, you know, yeah. able to drive. I but, remember um, my daughters yeah. were, um, three and one or almost three and one. My husband was gone. I'd been drinking. Mm-hmm. My, my older daughter was jumping on the bed and fell back and cracked her yeah. head. Um, I had to call my neighbor to come over and watch my youngest who was Mm -hmm. in bed by then. And I, I mean, yeah, I drove her. I'd been drinking. I was in the ER, like drunk. And yeah, but you know, fake it till you make it. But yeah, just, but just like, oh my God, like that was scary. I mean, did I stop after that? No, it took a while, but (laughs) I'm, it's, you do put yourself in these situations that uh-huh. you normally wouldn't have and and you find that everybody else is doing it too and it's just right. like wow I mean when you really get out of it you're like what the hell was I right. thinking like, wow exactly and I think um throughout you know throughout our lives there's always a reason to drink I mean usually everybody else is doing it right so like you're in high school you're just trying it out everybody's doing it college is what you do you binge drink and it's college parties and keg stands and whatever and then you're then you're uh, a young professional and that's what you do because you go out after work for drinks on a long week of work because you deserve it you know and then and then you become a parent and then you know you deserve it because you're parenting is hard and kids are you know uh hard to deal with sometimes and we're stressed and we need support yet we're being told that alcohol is the thing that's fixing, fixing, um, making us feel better. So, um, every stage of life, I feel like it just has a different uh, reason that we're, we're drinking, but the mommy wine culture, it's not that we're, you know, mad at the moms. We're kind of mad at the society that is telling us that we have to drink and that's, that's what will cure our, uh, anxiety, you know, and really it's just going to make your anxiety worse. Like this is science, you know, we've, 
so the more that we talk about it, I think the more people are like, oh, okay, yeah, I do feel kind of more anxious when I wake up after a night of, you know, a couple of glasses of wine or, yeah, I do feel more irritable, I notice, on a Saturday morning because I had a couple of glasses of wine on a Friday night. And it's not necessarily like binge drinking and, and drinking multiple, you know, bottles of wine. It's just kind of making people aware that just a couple glasses, if you just cut those out, you're going to feel a lot better. So. Yeah, absolutely. And then don't get me started on like these t-shirts and these <laughs> um, glasses and napkins and towels. And I could go on and on. Yeah. There's I they're really the everywhere. A, yeah. I lived on the street from a, um, drugstore that has a little gift store, you know, gift shop in it. And it's just like, I go in there and I mean, I have a heyday with all the pictures I can take. I'm trying to like hide my <laughs> phone well, trying to take all these pictures. Cause mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's just filled with, you know, my, it's not drinking alone. If your kids are home, you know, or like, uh, ma- off duty mom, like on a koozie or something. It's like, when are you enough? When are you off duty though? You know what I mean? Like you're not. Well, <laughs> and, and parent knows you're not off duty. Like you're a parent now. You know, I don't know. So it's just. Yeah, I mean, and it's also something that if if we want to go deeper, it is mm-hmm. you know, it's white female privilege. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, pastime. You you For know sure. it, the bonding. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's not as like normalized in black or brown people who right. are drinking you know they would have mm-hmm. child protective services called oh right exactly it, it's yeah, something we're out here with you know oh, what a, i don't even really know there's just so many like things you can buy now to like hide alcohol in or you know bring mm-hmm. it to your kids soccer games and your uh yeti totally can thing or whatever you know like it's not this it's also not this like where you think it's this problem in uh people who don't have you know homeless people or whatever people down under the bridge like no it's these suburban like you said white you know um families and moms that have these um moms that are struggling and they they're being told that that alcohol is a fix and they just don't know any better, you know, and it's not their fault. No. Well, so yeah. how about for people that are wanting to change their relationship mm-hmm. with alcohol? What would be your top tips? Yeah, I would say, um, so a lot of times people have a hard time thinking about like forever, you know, mm-hmm. like when I stopped, I had done enough experimenting where I knew that I either had to stop entirely or, I was just going to keep going the same way that I was. So for me, it had to be like forever from the beginning, but people are so scared to drop alcohol forever. Like it's their, you know, best friend Mm -hmm. when really it's not done much great for them. Um, So just try it out is what I would start with, you know, Um, try, try two weeks, like try when you get two weeks, notice how you feel. Um, If you're a person who is a journaling person, which I'm not a big journaler, but if you are, you know, write down how you feel every day when you wake up. Um, Notice like the things that you're getting to do now that you weren't doing before, like waking up uh, earlier on the weekend and getting more done, having a whole day of energy and not being hungover and irritable and things like that. Um, I would start looking at some... um, uh, I guess if you just type in like sober or sobriety or alcohol free on Instagram, you can find posts and accounts like mine and others that are sharing about things that they have been through or just facts about, you know, alcohol it depends kind of what content you like. Some people like more scientific stuff. Some people like more like experience kind of things. Um, but there's something for everyone out there. Um, I would also suggest reading the book This Naked Mind by Annie Grace and also We Are the Luckiest by Laura McCowan. Those are my top two that I always, um, especially if you're a mother, I would suggest We Are the Luckiest by Laura McCowan. Um, But yeah, those are my top two books. And then there's so many podcasts. Um, Sober Powered is a good podcast for uh, if you're into like more of like the science behind alcohol and drinking. Um, But yeah, so... 
just like research it a little bit and um, just kind of notice how you feel when you take those breaks. I think taking a break is good for, I mean, it's good for anybody, right? If you're, if you're a drinker, it's better to take a break and assess. Yeah. And it, it's good for your body too. Right. Exactly. You're going to feel better like regardless. So, um, yeah. How has your life changed since you gave up alcohol? Um, I, I just feel like everything is different. (laughs) Um, but it's not perfect either. Right. Like quitting drinking doesn't, doesn't all of a sudden everything is fixed in your life. Actually quitting drinking was one of the easier parts for me. Figuring out who I was without alcohol was harder because from, you know, 16 to 17 years old, I was drinking regularly. And besides when I was pregnant, literally every weekend and more. So I didn't even get to learn who I was as a young adult. And there's so much time in there that I missed of like, um, figuring out who I was, what I like to do. You know, I just kind of did what I thought I was supposed to do, I guess. Um, so Mm -hmm. really just trying to lean in on, you know, if I don't want to go do something, just don't go do it. Like It's as simple as that. Like I've learned like what I actually like to spend my time doing. And I don't care if you don't, think that my sitting on the couch watching TV is good enough, (laughs) you know? Um, but, um, I have been, I think I'm just like so much more motivated and, um, I have more energy, which I need because like I said, I have a five-year-old little boy, Mm -hmm. super busy and always on the go. Um, I, um, started writing, which I liked to do when I was a little kid. I used to write uh, and be, do these creative like videos and stuff. And so like, I'm kind of doing a lot of more of that now, um, now that I don't drink too. Um, never did any of, I never did anything really creative while I was drinking. Um, I'd always have like ideas about things that would be cool to do. And then you never, I mean, you get ideas and then you, you, you're too lazy or tired mm-hmm. or hung over to do it. So you never ever complete them, you know? So, um, most of the things that I'm doing today, like outside of work, like Instagram and writing and all that stuff uh, would never have been, I would have never done any of that if I was drinking. It would just be like, you know, drink, go to work, be so like, I wasn't drinking like all day or anything, but it would, it just wouldn't be, my life wasn't, wouldn't be as full as it is now. Yeah. So many benefits. Right. Well, what are your plans for the future? Yeah. So, uh, Ever since uh, COVID hit, I've really recognized how much I like to not work (laughs) (laughs) in a way that I cherish the time when I'm not at work. You know what I mean? Um, Yeah. We worked from home for just a little bit, maybe like a month or a month and a half. And I was like, Oh, I've just could, I would love to have a job where I can work from home and I cannot do that at my current job. And I don't want to leave my job. I like my job. I don't ever hate going to work actually in the morning, but, um, I'm, I'm looking at dropping hours a little bit to focus a little bit more on my writing. So kind of just like one day a week, but, um, I think that would be enough even just to do some more writing that way. Um, and looking at different kinds of writing too. I've been done some some Facebook ads and some email newsletters for people and blogs. Um, I wrote for a newspaper once, which I found I didn't like, so I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> um, we gotta try it out, right? So um, yeah, I just don't. The opportunities are endless, right? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the world is your oyster. Yeah, right. Exactly. So. Um, yeah, just kind of enjoying life. I don't I don't need like a whole I don't need fancy stuff or I don't need to be rich. Um I just want to be happy and kind of just do what makes me happy and um like a nice little life, nice simple uh comfortable life. So Yeah. Working at that. And and you're helping people. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's always part of you know, I know in like 12 step programs, they do talk about giving back and, um, that kind of thing. And so I think, um, my Instagram, especially now isn't really, um, 
it's not really for me anymore. I mean, it's nice to like, like, I don't feel like I need to like, you know, they're almost kind of like journal entries. I don't feel like I need to do that, but I, it's, it's easy. It comes easy to me to write up a post or, you know, write a quote and put it on a Canva page or whatever. Um, and it's fun. So it's like, I get to be creative, but also help people. And, and as soon as I feel kind of like, Oh, you know, Oh, I'm kind of like, what am I doing? Is this even doing anything? Like I literally, I say the universe hears me and then somebody sends me a message like, Oh my gosh, I'm on day two. And your post today really spoke to me and blah, 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 you know? So, so I get messages like all the time. And so that makes me realize, you know, I am actually helping people. Um, and I know that I am deep, deep down, but you know, imposter syndrome after a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can someone find you? Yeah. So my Instagram is sobriety activist, um, at sobriety activist on Instagram. Facebook is Blair shark dash writer. Um, so I'll po- I post, um, all my, my writing that I do and things like this podcast and things like that, that I've been featured on to there. And then, um, I will be soon starting an email newsletter as soon as I can figure that out, um, <laughs> <laughs> to kind of, uh, share different things. Um, and maybe, you know, like alcohol free drinks and stuff like that. Um, and also on my website is blairsharp.com. So B L A I R S H A R P.com. And I will put those in the show notes. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing and, yeah. and doing the good work, fighting the sobriety <laughs> fight. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Attention Idaho and California residents. If you're shopping for a mortgage, contact PacFi, a mortgage brokerage with the top wholesale lenders in the nation. They are committed to simplifying the mortgage process, saving you time and money. Call 858-442-7048 or visit pacfi.com. NMLS number 1462943, Equal Housing Lender. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Alcohol Tipping Point. I'm always here for you guys, so please feel free to reach out and talk to me on Instagram at Alcohol Tipping Point and check out my website, alcoholtippingpoint.com. Again, I hope you can use these tips we talked about for the rest of your week. And until then, see you next time.